A completeness without a clue and a stealthy silence of, of a neatly executed crime characterize this murderous disaster, which, as you may remember, had its gruesome celebrity. The wind would have prevented the loudest outcries from reaching the shore. There had been evidently no time for signals of distress. It was death without any sort of fuss. The Hamburg ship, filling all at once, capsized as she sank, and at daylight there was not even the end of a spare to be seen above water. She was missed, of course, and at first the Coast Guard surmised that she had either dragged her anchor or parted her cable sometime during the night and had been blown out to sea. Then after the tide turned, the wreck must have shifted a little and released some of the bodies because a child, a little fair-haired child in a red frock, came ashore abreast of the Martello Tower. By the afternoon, you could see along three miles of beach dark figures with bare legs dashing in and out of the tumbling foam and rough-looking men, women with hard faces, children, mostly fair-haired, were being carried off, stiff and dripping on stretchers, on waddles, on ladders, in a long procession past the door of the ship inn to be laid out in a row under the north wall of the Brinzette Church. Officially, the body of the little girl in the red frock is the first thing that came ashore from that ship, but I have patience amongst the seafaring population of Wiss Colebrook and Unofficially, I am informed that very early that morning, two brothers, who went down to look after their cobble hauled up on the beach, found a good way from Branzette, an ordinary ship's hen coop, lying high and dry on the shore, with eleven drowned ducks inside. Their families ate the birds, and the hen coop was split into firewood with hatchet. It is possible that a man, supposing he happened to be on deck at the time of the accident, might have floated ashore on that hen coop. He might, I admit, it is improbable, but there was the man in four days, nay, for weeks. It didn't enter our heads that we had amongst us the only living soul that had escaped from that disaster. The man himself, even when he learned to speak intelligibly, could tell us very little. He remembered he had felt better after the ship had anchored, I suppose, and that the darkness, the wind, and the rain took his breath away. This looks as if he had been on deck some time during that night, but we mustn't forget he had been taken out of his knowledge that he had been seasick and battered down below for four days, that he had no general notion of a ship or of the sea, and therefore could have no definite idea of what was happening to him. The rain, the wind, the darkness he knew. He understood the bleeding of the sheep, and he remembered the pain of his wretchedness and misery, his heartbroken astonishment that it was neither seen nor understood, his dismay at finding all the men angry and all the women fierce. He had approached them as a beggar, it is true, he said, but in his country, even if they gave nothing, they spoke gently to beggars. The children in his country were not taught to throw stones at those who asked for compassion. Smith's strategy overcame him completely. The wood lodge presented the horrible aspect of a dungeon. What would be done to him next? No wonder that Amy Foster appeared to his eyes with the aurora of an angel of light. The girl had not been able to sleep for thinking of the poor man, and in the morning, before the smiths were up, she slipped out across the backyard, holding the door of the wood lodge ajar. She looked in and extended to him half a loaf of white bread. Such bread as the rich eat in my country, he used to say. At this time he got up slowly from amongst all sorts of rubbish, stiff, hungry, trembling, miserable, and doubtful. Can you eat this? she asked in her soft and timid voice. He must have taken her for a gracious lady. He devoured ferociously, and tears were falling on the crust. Suddenly he dropped the bread, seized her wrist, and imprinted a kiss on her hand. She was not frightened. 
Through his forlorn condition, she had observed that he was good-looking. She shut the door and walked back slowly to the kitchen. Much later on, she told Mrs. Smith, who shuddered at the bare idea of being touched by the creature. Through this act of impulsive pity, he was brought back again within the pale of human relations with his new surroundings. He never forgot it. Never. That very same morning, old Mr. Swaffer, Smith's nearest neighbor, came over to give his advice and ended by carrying him off. He stood, unsteady on his legs, meek and caked over in half-dried mud, while the two men talked round him in, in an incomprehensible tongue. Mrs. Smith had refused to come downstairs till the madman was off the premises. Amy Foster, far from within the dark kitchen, watched through the open back door, and he obeyed the signs that were made to him to the best of his ability. But Smith was full of mistrust. Mine, sir, it may be all his cunning, he cried repeatedly in a tone of warning. When Mr. Swaffer started the mare, the deplorable being sitting humbly by his side through weakness nearly fell out over the back of the high two-wheeled cart. Swaffer took him straight home, and it is then that I came upon the scene. I was called in by the simple process of the old man beckoning to me with his forefinger over the gate of his house as I happened to be driving past. I got down, of course. I've got something here, he mumbled, leading the way to an outhouse at a little distance from his other farm buildings. It was there that I first saw him, in a long, low room taken upon the space of that sort of coach house. It was bare and whitewashed with a small square aperture glazed with one cracked, dusty pane at its further end. He was lying on his back upon a straw mallet. They had given him a couple of horse blankets, and he seemed to have spent the remainder of his strength in the exertion of cleaning himself. He was almost speechless, his quick breathing under the blankets pulling up his chin, his glittering restless black eyes reminded me of a wild bird caught in a snare. While I was examining him, old Swaffer stood silently by the door, passing the tips of his fingers along his shaven upper lip. I gave some directions, promised to send a bottle of medicine, and naturally made some more inquiries. Smith caught him in the stockyard at New Barnes, said the old chap in his deliberate, unmoved manner, and as if the other had been, indeed, a sort of wild animal, that's how I came by him. Quite a curiosity, isn't he? Now tell me, doctor, you've been all over the world. Don't you think that's a bit of a Hindu we've got hold of here? I was greatly surprised. His long black hair scattered over the straw bolster contrasted with the olive pallor of his face. It occurred to me he might be a Basque. It didn't need necessarily follow that he should understand Spanish, but I tried him with the few words I know, and also with some French. The whispered sounds I caught by bending my ear to his lips puzzled me utterly. That afternoon, the young ladies from the rectory, one of them read Goethe with a dictionary, and the other had struggled with Dante for years. Coming to see Miss Swaffer, tried their German and Italian on him from the doorway. They retreated, just the least bit scared by the flood of passionate speech which, turning on his palate, he let out at them. They admitted that the sound was pleasant, soft, musical, but in conjunction with his looks, perhaps, it was startling. So excitable, so utterly unlike anything one had ever heard. The village boys climbed up the bank to have a peep through the little square aperture. Everybody was wondering what Mr. Swaffer would do with him. He simply kept him. Swaffer would be called eccentric were he not so much respected. They tell you that Mr. Swaffer sits up as late as 10 o'clock at night to read books, and they will tell you also that he can write a check for 200 pounds without thinking twice about it. He himself would tell you that the Swaffers had owned land between this and Darnford for these 300 years. He must be 85 today, but he does not look a bit older 
than when I first came here. He is a great breeder of sheep and deals extensively in cattle. He attends market days for miles around in every sort of weather and drives sitting bowed low over the reins, his lank gray hair curling over the collar of his warm coat and with a green plaid rug around his legs. The calmness of advanced age gives a solemnity to his manner. He is clean-shaven, his lips are thin and sensitive, something rigid and monarchical in the set of his features lends a certain elevation to the character of his face. He has been known to drive miles in the rain to see a new kind of rose in somebody's garden or a monstrous cabbage grown by a cottager. He loves to hear tell of or to be shown something that he calls outlandish. Perhaps it was just that outlandishness of the man which influenced old Swaffer. Perhaps it was only an inexplicable caprice. All I know is that at the end of three weeks, I caught sight of Smith's lunatic digging in Swaffer's kitchen garden. They had found out he could use a spade. He dug barefooted. His black hair flowed over his shoulders. I suppose it was Swaffer who gave him the striped old cotton shirt, but he wore still the national brown cloth trousers in which he had been washed ashore, fitting to the leg almost like tights. It was belted with a broad leathern belt studded with little brass discs and had never yet ventured into the village. The land he looked upon seemed to him kept neatly like the grounds round a landowner's house. The size of the cart horses struck him with astonishment. The roads resembled garden walks and the aspect of the people, especially on Sundays, spoke of opulence. He wondered what made them so hard-hearted and their children so bold. He got his food at the back door, carried it in both hands carefully to his outhouse, and sitting alone on his pallet would make the sign of the cross before he began. Beside the same pallet, kneeling in the early dark of the short days, he recited aloud the Lord's Prayer before he slept. Whenever he saw old Swaffer, he would bow with veneration from the waist and stand erect while the old man, with his fingers over his lower lip, surveyed him silently. He bowed also to Miss Swaffer, who kept house frugally for her father, a broad-shouldered, big-boned woman of forty-five, with the pocket of her dress full of keys and a gray, steady eye. She was church, as people said, while her father was one of the trustees of the Baptist chapel, and wore a little steel cross at her waist, she dressed severely in black in memory of one of the innumerable Bradleys of the neighborhood to whom she had been engaged some twenty-five years ago, a young farmer who broke his neck out hunting on the eve of the wedding day. She had the unmoved countenance of the deaf, spoke very seldom, and her lips, thin like her father's, astonished one sometimes by a mysteriously ironic curl. These were the people to whom he owed allegiance, and an overwhelming loneliness seemed to fall from the leaden sky of that winter without sunshine. All the faces were sad. He could talk to no one, and had no hope of ever understanding anybody. It was as if there had been the faces of people from the other world, dead people, he used to tell me years afterwards. Upon my word, I wonder he did not go bad. He didn't know where he was, somewhere very far from his mountains, somewhere over the water. Was this America, he wondered. If it hadn't been for the steel cross at Miss Swaffer's belt, he would not, he confessed, have known whether he was in a Christian country at all. He used to cast stealthy glances at it and feel comforted. There was nothing here the same as in his country. The earth and the water were different. There were no images of the reindeer by the roadside. The very grass was different, and the trees. All the trees but the three old Norway pines on the bit of lawn before Swaffer's house, and these reminded him of his country. 
He had been detected once, after dusk, with his forehead against the trunk of one of them, sobbing and talking to himself. They had been like brothers to him at that time, he affirmed. Everything else was strange. Conceive you the kind of an existence overshadowed, oppressed by the everyday material appearances as if by visions of a nightmare. At night, when he could not sleep, he kept on thinking of the girl who gave him the first piece of bread he had eaten in this foreign land. She had been neither fierce nor angry nor frightened. Her face he remembered as the only comprehensible face amongst all these faces that were as closed, as mysterious, and as mute as the faces of the dead who are possessed of knowledge beyond the comprehension of the living. I wonder whether the memory of her compassion prevented him from cutting his throat. But there, I suppose I am an old sentimentalist, and forget the instinctive love of life which it takes all the strength of an uncommon despair to overcome. He did the work which was given him with an intelligence which surprised old Swaffer by and by. It was disclosed that he could help at the plowing, could milk the cows, feed the bullocks in the cattle yard, and was of some use with the sheep. He began to pick up words, too, very fast, and suddenly, one fine morning in spring, he rescued from an untimely death the grandchild of old Swaffer. Swaffer's young daughter is married to Wilcox, a solicitor and the town clerk of Colebrook. Regularly, twice a year, they come to stay with the old man for a few days. Their only child, a little girl not three years old at the time, ran out of the house alone in her little white pinafore, and toddling across the grass of a terraced garden, pitched herself over a low wall, head first into the horse pond in the yard below. Our man was out with the wagoneer and the plow in the field nearest to the house, and as he was leading the team round to begin a fresh furrow, he saw through the gap of the gate what for anybody else would have been a mere flutter of something white. But he had straight glancing, quick, far-reaching eyes that only seemed to flinch and lose their amazing power before the immensity of the sea. He was barefooted and looking as outlandish as the heart of Swaffer could desire. Leaving the horses on the turn to the inexpressible disgust of the wagoneer, he bounded off, going over the plowed ground in long leaps, and suddenly appeared before the mother, thrust the child into her arms, and strode away. The pond was not very deep, but still, if he had not had such good eyes, the child would have perished, miserably suffocated in the foot or so of sticky mud at the bottom. Old Swaffer walked out slowly into the field, waited till the plow came over to his side, had a good look at him, and without saying a word, went back to the house. But from that time, they laid out his meals on the kitchen table, and at first, Miss Swaffer, all in black and with inscrutable face, would come and stand in the doorway of the living room to see him make a big sign of the cross before he fell to. I believe that from that day, too, Swaffer began to pay him regular wages. I can't follow step by step his development. He cut his hair short, was seen in the village, and along the road going to and fro in his work like any other man. Children ceased to shout after him. He became aware of social differences, but remained for a long time surprised at the bare poverty of the churches among so much wealth. He couldn't understand either why they were shut up on weekdays. There was nothing to steal in them. What well, was it to keep people from praying too often? The rectory took much notice of him about that time, and I believe the young ladies attempted to prepare the ground for his conversion. They could not, however, break him of his habit of crossing himself, but he went so far as to take off the string with a couple of brass medals the size of a sixpence and a tiny metal cross and a square sort of scapulary which he wore around his neck. He hung them on the wall by the side of his bed, and he was still to be heard every evening reciting the Lord's Prayer in incomprehensible words in a slow, fervent tone, as he had heard his father do at the head of all the kneeling family, big and little, on every evening of his life. 
and though he wore corduroys at work and a slop made pepper and salt suit on Sundays strangers would turn round to look after him on the road his foreignness had a peculiar and indelible stamp at last people became used to see him but they never became used to him his rapid skimming walk his swarthy complexion his hat cocked on the left ear his habit on warm evenings of wearing his coat over one shoulder like a hussar's dolman his manner of leaping over the stiles not as a feat of agility but in the ordinary course of progression all these peculiarities were as one may say so many causes of scorn and offense of the inhabitants of the village they wouldn't in their dinner hour lie flat on their backs on the grass to stare at the sky neither did they go about the field screaming dismal tunes many times i have heard his high-pitched voice behind the ridge of some sloping sheep walk a voice light and soaring like a lark's but with a melancholy human note over our fields that hear only the song of birds and I should be startled myself, eh? He was different, innocent of heart, full of good will, which nobody wanted this castaway, that, like a man transplanted into another planet, was separated by an immense space from his past and by an immense ignorance from his future. His quick, fervent utterance positively shocked everybody. An excitable devil, they called him. One evening in the tap room of the coach and horses, having drunk some whiskey he upset them all by singing a love song of his country they hooted him down and he was pained but preble the lame wheelwright and vincent the fat blacksmith and the other notables too wanted to drink their evening beer in peace on another occasion he tried to show them how to dance the dust rose in clouds from the sanded floor he leapt straight up amongst the deal tables struck his heels together squatted on one heel in front of old preble shooting out the other leg uttered wild and exulting cries jumping up to whirl on one foot snapping his fingers above his head and a strange carter who was having a drink in there began to swear and cleared out with his half pint in his hand into the bar but when suddenly he sprang upon a table and continued to dance among the glasses the landlord interfered he didn't want any acrobatic tricks in the tap room. They laid their hands on him, having had a glass or two. Mr. Swaffer's foreigner tried to expostulate, was ejected forcibly, got a black eye. I believe he felt the hostility of his human surroundings, but he was tough, tough in spirit too, as well as in body. Only the memory of the sea frightened him, with that vague terror that is left by a bad dream. His home was far away, and he did not want now to go to America. I had often explained to him that there is no place on earth where true gold can be found lying ready and to be got for the trouble of the picking up of it. How then, he asked, could he ever return home with empty hands when there had been, a, been sold a cow, two ponies, and a bit of land to pay for his going? His eyes would fill with tears, and averting them from the immense shimmer of the sea, he would throw himself face down on the grass. But sometimes, cocking his hat with a little conquering air, he would defy my wisdom. He had found his bit of true gold. That was Amy Foster's heart, which was a golden heart and soft to people's misery. He would say in the accents of overwhelming conviction, he was called Yonko. He explained that this meant Little John, but as he would also repeat very often that he was a mountaineer, some word sounding in the dialect of his country like Gural, he got it for his surname. And this is the only trace of him that the succeeding ages may find in the marriage register of the parish. There it stands, Yonko Gural and the rector's handwriting. The crooked cross made by the castaway, a cross whose tracing, no doubt, seemed to him the most solemn part of the whole ceremony, as all that remains to now perpetuate the memory of his name. 
His courtship had lasted some time, ever since he got his precarious footing in the community. It began by his buying for Amy Foster a green satin ribbon in Darnford. This was what you did in his country. You bought a ribbon at a Jew stall on a fair day. I don't suppose the girl knew what to do with it, but he seemed to think that his honorable intentions could not be mistaken. It was only when he declared his purpose to get married that I fully understood how, for a hundred futile and inappreciable reasons, how, shall I say odious, he was to all the countryside. Every old woman in the village was up in arms. Smith, coming upon him near the farm, promised to break his head for him if he found him about again. But he twisted his little black mustache with such a bellicose air and rolled such big, black, fierce eyes at Smith that this promise came to nothing. Smith, however, told the girl that she must be mad to take up with a man who was surely wrong in his head. All the same, when she heard him in the gloaming whistle from beyond the orchard of a couple of bars of a weird, mournful tune, she would drop whatever she had in her hand. She would leave Mrs. Smith in the middle of a sentence, and she would run out to his call. Mrs. Smith called her a shameless hussy. She answered nothing. She said nothing at all to anybody, and went on her way as if she had been deaf. She and I alone, in all the land, I fancy, could see his very real beauty. He was very good-looking, and most graceful in his bearing, with that something wild as of a woodland creature in his aspect. Her mother moaned over her dismays whenever the girl came to see her on her day out. The father was surly, but pretended not to know, and Mrs. Finn once told her plainly that this man, my dear, will do you some harm some day yet, and so it went on. They could be seen on the roads, she tramping stolidly in her finery, gray dress, black feather, stout boots, prominent white cotton gloves that caught your eye a hundred yards away, and he, his coat slung picturesquely over one shoulder, pacing by her side, gallant of bearing and casting tender glances upon the girl with the golden heart. I wonder whether he saw how plain she was, perhaps among types so different from what he had ever seen, he had not the power to judge, or perhaps he was seduced by the divine quality of her pity. Yanko was in great trouble meantime. In his country, you get an old man for an ambassador in marriage affairs. He did not know how to proceed. However, one day in the midst of the sheep in a field, he was now Swaffer's under-shepherd with Foster, he took off his hat to the father and declared himself humbly, I dare say she's fool enough to marry you, was all Foster said. And then he used to relate, he puts his hat on his head, looks black at me as if he wanted to cut my throat, whistles the dog, and off he goes, leaving me to do the work. The Fosters, of course, didn't like to lose the wages the girl earned. Amy used to give all her money to her mother, but there was in Foster a very genuine aversion to that match. He contended that the fellow was very good with sheep, but was not fit for any girl to marry. For one thing, he used to go along the hedges muttering to himself like a damn fool. And then, these foreigners behave very queerly to women sometimes, and perhaps he would want to carry her off somewhere, or run off himself. It was not safe. He preached it, to his daughter that the fellow might ill use her in some way. She made no answer. It was, they said in the village, as if the man had done something to her. People discussed the matter. It was quite an excitement, and the two went on walking out together in the face of opposition. Then something unexpected happened. I don't know whether old Swaffer ever understood how much he was regarded in the light of a father by his foreign retainer. Anyway, the relation was curiously futile. So when Yanko asked formally for an interview, and the Miss too, he called the severe deaf Miss Swaffer by simply Miss. 
it was to obtain their permission to marry. Swaffer heard him, unmoved, dismissed him by a nod, and then shouted the intelligence into Miss Swaffer's best ear. She showed no surprise and only remarked grimly in a veiled, blank voice, he certainly won't get any other girl to marry him. It is Miss Swaffer who has all the credit of the munificence. But in a very few days, it came out that Mr. Swaffer had presented Yanko with a cottage, the cottage you've seen this morning, and something like an acre of ground, had made it over to him an absolute property. Wilcox expedited the deed, and I remember him telling me he had a great pleasure in making it ready. It recited, in consideration of saving the life of my beloved grandchild, Bertha Wilcox. Of course, after no power on earth could prevent them from getting married, her infatuation endured, people saw her going out to meet him in the evening. She stared with unblinking, fascinated eyes up the road where he was expected to appear, walking freely, with a swing from the hip and humming one of the love tunes of his country. When the boy was born, he got elevated at the coach and horses, essayed again a song and a dance, and was again ejected. People expressed their commiseration for a woman married to that jack-in-the-box. He didn't care. There was a man now, he told me boastfully, to whom he could sing and talk in the language of his country and show how to dance by and by. But I don't know. To me, he appeared to have grown less springy of a step, heavier in body, less keen of eye. Imagination, no doubt, but it seems to me now as if the net of fate had been drawn closer around him already. One day I met him on the footpath of the Talford Hill. He told me that women were funny. I had heard already of domestic differences, People were saying that Amy Foster was beginning to find out what sort of man she had married. He looked upon the sea with indifferent, unseeing eyes. His wife had snatched the child out of his arms one day as he sat on the doorstep crooning to it a song such as the mothers sing to babies in his mountains. She seemed to think he was doing it some harm. Women are funny, and she had objected to him praying aloud in the evening. Why, he expected the boy to repeat the prayer aloud after him by and by, as he used to do after his old father when he was a child in his own country. And I discovered he longed for their boy to grow up so that he could have a man to talk with in that language that to our ears sounded so disturbing, so passionate, and so bizarre. Why his wife should dislike the idea, he couldn't tell. But that would pass, he said and tilting his head knowingly, he tapped his breastbone to indicate that she had a good heart, not hard, not fierce, open to compassion, charitable to the poor. I walked away thoughtfully, wondered whether his difference, his strangeness, were not penetrating with repulsion that dull nature they had begun irresistibly attracting. I wondered. The doctor came to the window and looked out at the frigid splendor of the sea, immense in the haze, as if enclosing all the earth with all the hearts lost among the passions of love and fear. Physiologically now, he said, turning away abruptly, it was possible, it was possible. He remained silent, then went on. At all events, the next time I saw him he was ill, lung trouble. He was tough, but I dare say he was not acclimatized as well as I had supposed. It was a bad winter, and of course these mountaineers do get fits of homesickness, and a state of depression would make him vulnerable. He was lying half-dressed on a couch downstairs. A table covered with a dark oil cloth took up all the middle of the little room. There was a wicker cradle on the floor, a kettle spouting steam on the hob, and some child's linen laying drying on the fender. The room was warm, but the door opens right into the garden, as you noticed, perhaps. He was very feverish and kept on muttering to himself. She sat on a chair and looked at him fixedly across the table with her brown, blurred eyes. Why don't you have him upstairs, I asked. With a start and a confused stammer, she said, 
Oh, ah, I couldn't sit with him upstairs, sir. I gave her certain directions, and going outside, I said again that he ought to be in bed upstairs. She wrung her hands. I couldn't. I couldn't. He keeps on saying something. I don't know what. With the memory of all the talk against the man that had been dined into her ear, I looked at her narrowly. I looked into her short-sighted eyes, at her dumb eyes, that once in her life had seen an enticing shape, but seemed staring at me to see nothing at all now. But I saw she was uneasy. What's the matter with him? She asked in a sort of vacant trepidation. He doesn't look very ill. I never did see anybody look like this before. Do you think, I asked indignantly, he is shamming? I can't help it, sir, she said stolidly. And suddenly she clapped her hands and looked right and left. And there's the baby. I'm so frightened. He wanted me just now to give him the baby. I can't understand what he says to it. Can't you ask a neighbor to come in tonight, I asked. Please, sir, nobody seems to care to come, she muttered, dully, resigned all at once. I impressed upon her the necessity of the greatest care, and then had to go. There was a good deal of sickness that winter. Oh, I hope he won't talk, she exclaimed softly, just as I was going away. I don't know how it is I did not see, but I didn't. And yet, turning in my trap, I saw her lingering before the door, very still, as if meditating a flight up the miry road. Towards the night, his fever increased. He tossed, moaned, now and then muttered a complaint, and she sat with the table between her and the couch, watching every movement and every sound with terror. The unreasonable terror of that man she could not understand creeping over her. She had drawn the wicker cradle close to her feet. There was nothing in her now but the maternal instinct and that unaccountable fear. Suddenly coming to himself, parched, he demanded a drink of water. She did not move. She had not understood, though he may have thought he was speaking in English. But he waited, looking at her, burning with fever, amazed at her silence and immobility, and then he shouted impatiently, Water! Give me water! She jumped to her feet, snatched up the child, and stood still. He spoke to her, and his passionate remonstrances only increased her fear of that strange man. I believe he spoke to her for a long time, entreating, wondering, pleading, ordering, I suppose. She says she bore it as long as she could, and then a gust of rage came over him. He sat up and called out terribly one word, some word. Then he got up, as though he hadn't been ill at all, she says, and as in fevered dismay, indignation and wonder, he tried to get her round the table. She simply opened the door and ran out with the child in her arms. She heard him call twice after her down the road in a terrible voice and fled. Ah, but you should have seen stirring behind the dull, blurred glance of these eyes the specter of the fear which had haunted her on that night three miles and a half to the door of Foster's cottage. I did the next day, and it was I who found him lying face down in his body in a puddle just outside the little wicket gate. I had been called out that night into an urgent case in the village and on my way home at daybreak passed by the cottage. The door stood open. My man helped me to carry him in. We laid him on the couch. The lamp smoked. The fire was out. The chill of the stormy night oozed from the cheerless yellow paper on the wall. Amy, I called aloud, and my voice seemed to lose itself in the emptiness of his tiny house, as if I had cried in the desert. He opened his eyes. Gone, he said distinctly. I had only asked for water, only for a little water. He was muddy. I covered him up and stood waiting in silence, catching a painfully gasped word now and then. They were no longer in his own language. The fever had left him, taking with it the heat of life, and with his panting breast and lustrous eye, he reminded me again of a wild creature under the net, a bird caught in a snare. She had left him. She had left him sick, helpless, thirsty. 
The spear of the hunter had entered his very soul. Why, he cried in the penetrating and indignant voice of a man calling to a responsible maker. A gust of wind and a swish of rain answered, and as I turned away to shut the door, he pronounced the word merciful and expired. Eventually, I certified heart failure as the immediate cause of death. His heart must have indeed failed him, or else he might have stood this night of storm and exposure too. I closed his eyes and drove away. Not very far from the cottage, I met Foster walking sturdily between the dripping hedges with his collie at his heels. Do you know where your daughter is? I asked. Don't I? he cried. I am going to talk to him a bit, frightening a poor woman like this. He won't frighten her any more, I said. He is dead. He struck with his stick at the mud, and there's the child. Then after thinking deeply for a while, I don't know that it isn't for the best. That's what he said. And she says nothing at all now, not a word of him. Never. Is his image as utterly gone from her mind as his lithe and striding figure, his caroling voice, are gone from the fields? He is no longer before her eyes to excite her imagination into a passion of love or fear, and his memory seems to have vanished from her dull brain as the shadow passes away upon a white screen. She lives in the cottage and works for Miss Whopper, as she is Amy Foster for everybody, and the child is Amy Foster's boy. She calls him Johnny, which means little John. It is impossible to say whether this name recalls anything to her. Does she ever think of the past? I've seen her hanging over the boy's cot in a very passion of maternal tenderness. The little fellow was lying on his back, a little frightened at me, but very still, with his big black eyes, with his fluttered air of a bird in a snare, and looking at him, I seemed to see again the other one, the father, cast out mysteriously by the sea to perish in the supreme disaster of loneliness and despair.